But you wanna believe, then you can leave it up to me And I'll give you the key, it's easy Just keep on hopping, keep on rocking And don't start stopping I'm everything you need, just to walk the scene And if you wanna make it you can give it to me I'll embrace it, I believe for you You wouldn't believe what I see in you So don't stop, don't let the dream drop hop Hold up and make it lovely, make it real And make it yours Don't stop We have kind of uh, stayed in touch and you have been traveling a lot and looking at all sorts of things with all these tribes and um, just so amazing. Like if you guys don't follow her on Instagram, uh, it was a lot of fun seeing all these things you were doing and where you were going. So I'm excited to talk about that and how it relates to health and some of the things that you noticed on the podcast today. Yes. Yeah. It's been a really incredible year. I mean, just since January, uh, three continents and and just kind of all over the place. So I'm excited to share what I've learned as well. Awesome. Well, so first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself so we can kind of give the listeners a recap, because I know that some people may not be familiar with who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Mary Reddick. I'm a nutritionist. I spent a lot of my time in the field researching. My specialty in practice is in neuromuscular conditions and in rare conditions. And right now I'm really hyper-focusing on the long COVID, the dysautonomia and the post-viral syndrome, having been what I went through, uh, something very similar to what I went through that got me in this field. So I've been really hyper-focusing on that this year, in addition to my research studies. So I spent a lot of time in the field and then also speaking at conferences and those kinds of things. I love it. Well, so can you touch a little bit, just short, I know we'll, people could go back to our other episode if they want to learn a little bit about your history, but in a nutshell, you were really sick and you actually figured out how to heal yourself. Yes. Yeah. I was very lucky. I, you know, I grew up healthy and when I was working at a field station, I got a microbe that ended up going into my brain and nervous system and caused a post post-infection syndrome where I had a, a dysautonomia, a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, which really, you know, at that time we really thought wasn't reversible and was quite significant. You could have mild or severe cases and I was a severe case. So I went from an athlete like yourself to really not being able to move very much and spent about 12 years, my entire twenties, and then also 18 and 19, very, very sick and disabled on a lot of medications, chasing down uh, the whole white rabbit of trying to get <laughs> healed and into remission. And ironically, it was in, in stopping to chase that white rabbit, at least in the Western med- medicine system, and, and looking at what I could do on my own and, and what maybe was done in the past to get past similar situations that I got out of it. And it, it wasn't fast, it wasn't easy, but it was really wonderful. And <laughs> I ended up, I tried a lot of different diets, as many of us do, and also lifestyle protocols and gosh, all the things, all the things. I think you get very humbled when you go through these situations, you just throw the kitchen sink at it and you have to, because maybe one of those things will stick. And luckily enough, many years into my trial and errors, I stumbled on a a very specific version of the GAPS diet. So basically I was just eating a ketogenic chicken soup (laughs) every day for two years, but it worked actually. That in conjunction with the lifestyle things I was doing really worked. I went into a full remission and was able to go back to school. When I went back to school, I finished my undergrad degree. And then I just had this religious fervor about what had just happened. I couldn't believe that I had healed just by changing my groceries and my lifestyle activities with something so significant. And, and so I went back and studied nutrition thinking it would be a hobby. And here I am over a decade later and a really full career. So it ended up being really great. I love it. Well, that is an amazing story. I mean, I had a similar story. That's how we originally first connected. And um, yeah, so now you're in this major career where you're getting to travel and check out all these places and different ways of life and the, the nutrition and all of that. So can you walk us through a little bit of your trip and what you learned on that trip? Sure. Oh, I've had so many. I mean, oh my gosh, I've been in so many places, even just since January. So In January, I was in Panama studying with the Ambera tribe, which are a very joyful, colorful, beautiful tribe. 
that live, gosh, really only a couple hours away from Panama City, but you leave Panama City and suddenly you're you're in the wilderness. You're in the real wilderness. I mean, the houses are up on sticks to prevent the jaguars coming in at night, and it's very exciting. After them, I went and saw the, uh, well, I went to the San Blas Islands to study the Guna tribe there, and they're, they're interesting. They're one of the few tribes on earth that's still on their natural land that hasn't been moved, and that's a real feat in Panama especially. I mean, back in around I forget the year now, it was about 1925 or so, the bulk of the tribes were wiped out in Panama, as, as does happen, and really only about seven remained, but most were displaced. And and this one was not. The, the U.S. government actually stepped in. I'm sure there was, <laughs> there was some motivation there because of the Panama Canal, but they were actually able to stay on their land, and they have just hundreds of these tiny little islands. It's often just an island large enough for a hut, and one family will live on it. Uh, yeah, so it's it's really neat, and they're, they're an interesting one because you can see the progression as you go through the water. You know, you can be on a boat for seven hours and still be in Guna land. And so if you get to some of the the islands close in, uh, it's westernized. Although they're living mostly on fish and things like that, they're able to go in and get soda from the cities. So it's a long, it's a long, tedious jaunt to get there. I have to tell you, the, even just the road to get to the, the port in which you go to the islands, two of the people in our car were throwing up over and over again. I mean, the road was insane. <laughs> and you're on that for hours. And then you get on a boat and you go through very choppy boats. These are not glamorous, uh, nice sailing boats. <laughs> are rough you are hurting your tailbone on the waves and then you go through those and then you get to the islands and uh and and they have a program where you can go and visit them that's pretty great they'll take you from Panama City so if someone just wants to go and visit the shallow islands the the ones close up you can get there pretty easily if you go to Panama City and can dedicate a couple days but uh but the real stuff is is a bit deeper in and it's it's an interesting program there because only the guna can take you in which i think is a really good thing uh, it keeps them uh employed in a healthy way and proud of their culture which is great so i was there and then after that i went to peru and to the amazon and so i studied with the quechua people and then i went into the amazon with the machigengas and a few of the other tribes there there's about seven in that region. They, they're often lumped in as one, but they're actually very different. Their languages, their customs are different. Uh, they have different belief systems and all those kinds of things. And that, that was eye-opening. That was probably the roughest trip I've ever <laughs> that was like, That was eye-opening. I mean, the sheer amount of things that can kill you there at any moment. And yet there's just these people running around barefoot and the kids around barefoot. And it boggles the mind. I don't know if they're on a different dimension to where these things don't hurt them. I don't understand, but uh, but it was amazing and scary and exciting. I felt like Indiana Jones. It was great. And uh, <laughs> and Liver King joined me on that one, which was really nice. Brian Johnson is such such a nice guy. He came down with his family and I helped take him in there and introduce him around and they loved him. They thought he was so interesting. They'd never seen a body like his, you know? <laughs> But they're very little people, so yeah. it was really fun. And then after after the Amazon, actually shortly after, really just a few weeks after, I went up through Mexico. There's a tribe in Mexico I've been wanting to get to, but I haven't. So we'll shelve that to when I can get there. And then uh, then I went to Tanzania to go see the Maasai again and Hadza and the Datoga and all of those those groups. And see my old friends there. We uh, brought the cows for kids funds and and funded a whole huge Maasai school, which was really fun. Uh, again, not to feed hungry children. I want to be really clear: the kids are not hungry. <laughs> it's just that we're bringing a traditional diet to this school. We're not saving anyone. They have plenty of food, mm -hmm. but they don't have their traditional diets in the school. And uh, and then yeah, so that was really good. We toured all around there and uh, had a very interesting experience. To be honest, so I went and saw some of the, the same Hudsa groups, but they had changed a lot, even in just the last year and a half. Hmm. And the Maasai had gone, it, like they had switched members actually, and also switched where they were and as such really presented very differently. So it was really good for me to go back so, so quickly after my last visit and see the change. I think it, it really relays how some people can go and have such a different takeaway than mm -hmm. others but 
also I saw the Messiah after a really horrific drought. And so it was good to, well, it wasn't good. It was terrible to see, but it, it was healthy for me to see them in, in somewhat less than perfect standards mm-hmm. because they always just glow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they're just really amazing. And mm-hmm. they were still doing really great, but the cows look different, you know, because of this very severe drought that they had had, it was significant. I mean, it was through the whole continent for the most part, um, not the whole continent, but most of it. Mm -hmm. uh the cows were more drawn they weren't Mm -hmm. they they, it didn't look like in some of the villages I went to I didn't want to drink that blood others Mm -hmm. I I did and I I did Mm -hmm. but yeah so that was that was there and then after that I went down to South Africa for quite some time and then headed up to Greenland into the Mm -hmm. Arctic up to the most northernmost point and hung out with some of the the Greenlandic cultures there we would call them Inuit but they're really Greenlandic Mm -hmm. uh is is what we would say which was again an eye-opening experience because the language barrier there was more significant than I've ever had. Mm-hmm. I'm used to language barriers. I'm used to having to learn the language of where I'm going, at least to get by. Mm-hmm. But this was different. The Greenlandic language, only about 30,000 people speak. And and amongst that, there's four different dialects, which are completely different from each other. So really, there's only about 10,000 people. There's no Google Translate. There's no good handout to learn this. And, and if, you're, if you're Danish, you can maybe get by, right? Because mm-hmm. the Danish have settled. Uh, so some of them know some of that, but they no English. <laughs> snow English, not outside of the tourist uh, cities down south. So it was very interesting. And then it was also, it was such a cultural immersion and culture shock, I would say, almost culture shock. I don't really get those, but I think that would be my version because, <laughs> because it was genuinely so different. It was you almost had to laugh because it was so different. You go and and the Greenlandic folks are just so happy all the time. They're they're giggling all the time. Like grown men will hang out having a drink together and giggling, you know, so <laughs> for hours. I have no idea what they're saying. That's my you know, kind of culture it's, right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so laid back. It's so incredibly laid back. And I had had an introduction to it because I had been working for months on arranging a trip up in the Canadian Arctic that fell through. Ultimately, I could have gone on, but it had changed so much. The people taking me had really changed and it wasn't going to be what I was looking for. It it sounded like it was going to be more of like a, an animal excursion kind Mm -hmm. of thing instead of a cultural one. And that fell through because of some of the cultural threads that weave all the way through the Greenlandic, the Siberian, some of the Russian parts, and then all the way through to Alaska, there's a genetic thread that runs through there. And so although they're often all called the same name, they're very different even from village to village, but and but genetically they're similar and there's some threads. And here's one, <laughs> that is that if, if they, say that they're going to do something a contract it could even sign a contract it doesn't hold culturally they they're not they don't feel responsible like uh i might i i would feel very responsible if i had signed a contract and i'm like yes i'm going to do this this and this i'd be apologizing you know if i had to break it for any reason for them culturally it's not like that at all they have this inner freedom in their culture where if they don't feel like doing something they don't do it and it's not rude it's not even close to rude. It's like, it would be rude to do the thing when you don't want to. It is so different. It's so different. So because of that, you can't count on anything actually happening. You just have to be lucky. So I had a now friend up there, this wonderful photographer who's been going up for decades and he knows lots of the people up there and he wasn't my guide. I just ran into him there and we became friends over all the debacles that happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And he told me about how he had been in a very remote village that you have to take a dog sled. So you take about five different flights through Greenland. So it takes several days. You have to wait overnight at airports and then you you get the next flight. And sometimes you have to wait a week. It depends on the the weather and that kind of thing. So you finally get to Quanog, which is Mm -hmm. one of the most northernmost towns. And it's about 600 people. And then from there, you go out to the more, uh, the further regions essentially. Quanag is fabulous and and very remote, but you, in general, you would go out on a dog sled and it would take maybe two, three days by dog sled to get to a village. You can get to some with 10 hours. It depends on the weather. 
But anyway, he was in one of these remote villages and he was talking to his friend, who's a genuine friend. They've been friends for 20 years, but is, is Inuit or Greenlandic. And he was like, hey, can you, I've got a flight. Can you take me to, to the airport? To, uh, can you get me to Quanog? Can you take me tomorrow? I, I can't miss my flight. It's very expensive. And the guy's like, ah, sure, sure. And then of course doesn't take him. Oh, stuck no. for weeks. And this is this is like a normal situation. But what's interesting there, and I've had this in a couple other regions as well, but nothing as distinct as here, there's no financial motivation. There's no societal motivation. There's no pressure you can apply to like get something done because it is all so relaxed, which mm-hmm. is part of the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. Right. So so I was talking to some people after this trip and they wanted to go out for like a week. And I, w- I just had to tell them, no, <laughs> you need at least two months to get anything done out there. Really, you need months, like significant. And because of the weather issues and then the communication and then the lack of motivation, um, the the really neat thing about the culture up there from what I can ascertain is that they're very relational. So everything is done based on friendships, which Mm -hmm. is so different, right? There's nothing like, I will give you $10,000 if you will, you know, get on this video and do these things. No, it wouldn't happen. You couldn't throw anything at them. My friend had tried that. He was like, no, I have the flight is very expensive. And then I have these other flights that I need to get after that. And I'll miss those. And there's just no concept. So they're just like, Meh, maybe we'll go. <laughs> oh, so that's crazy to think about really, because you're, when you remove the financial part, especially, especially we as Americans are so driven by, yes. by money. Everything yes. we do is, I mean, there's money behind it, no matter how you think about it. Right. I mean, and so you'd remove that and it's amazing how different the relationship dynamic is and, and your motivational (laughs) dynamic. That's crazy. I never thought of that. Yeah. I think the main motivation, and I could be wrong because I I do think it would take decades to study the culture accurately uh, because it's so interesting and so different. Uh, I think their main motivation really is just how they feel in that moment. And then also the weather, the weather really comes into play. (laughs) They can see things that we can't. I mean, (laughs) I had very lucky weather when I was there. It was 24 hour sun, which was amazing to experience. I had so much energy. I needed very little sleep. It was very different, but, uh, but the whole place is a, is a bit of a meditation actually you're up there and it's just you're very very present everything is so beautiful everything is so calm and there's there's a lot of dangers of course so the hunters go out and it's always dangerous for them especially in walrus season but at any time I mean we were on a dog sled and and we went over which by the way is very relaxing they're not as fast as they look it's very it's really calming (laughs) but uh, yeah but we went over two cracks in the ice. So most of Greenland had already gone into summer, which means that you still have snow on the lands, but not, not elsewhere. And it's past dog, dog sledding season. And where I was, it's still dog sledding season because the ocean is still frozen. It was very high and it was very north. And, but it was starting to crack and they were switching from seal season to narwhal season. And narwhal is when the ice cracks and, and the ocean is, is accessible. Seal is when it's not. So it had started to crack. And even when I first got there, it had thin cracks, like, you know, maybe three, three inches, something like that. And that's where we would go and we would do our ice fishing, which again is surprisingly easy. I I have to tell you, I was, one of my clients had recommended that I watch a a movie on Greenland, uh, one of the old first explorers back in the day uh, on Netflix. And it was so sensational. And when you're there, it's not so dangerous. It's pretty calm. (laughs) It's honestly pretty calm. (laughs) But, uh, but I will say that on our way back, from one of the dog sleds, the cracks had gotten so big that the dogs wouldn't go over. It took hours for the guy mm. to get the, the dogs to actually go over. And we almost fell in twice and you're falling into the ocean. You know, it's, <laughs> it's rather exhilarating. <laughs> so there, there is danger, but most of the time it's very calm and beautiful and rather joyful and relaxed there, I would say. So, and I mean, food wise, nutrition wise, there must not be a lot of motivation either, because it seems like that it's pretty accessible to them as far as nutrition goes. Very, 
Very. I, I think there's so much dialogue about the nutrition up in the Arctic as to what people should be eating or uh, environmental concerns, these kinds of things. But those people must not have been up there because they don't overeat or overhunt anything. It's too much work to be mm-hmm. frank. It's, it's a lot of work to get it. It's not like some of the other places I've been to. And uh, not that it's impossible. I mean, every single day people got seals. Uh, just that you are, it, it is dangerous. I mean, polar bear is a food up there and that's a polar bear mm-hmm. that you're going after. So, so it's not the safest thing, but there's also lots of easily accessible fish. Like we ate a lot of king clip. We ate a lot of seal. We ate a lot of other things. It was interesting though, because in, in uh, the main town, you'll have a grocery store that's fully stocked by mm-hmm. Denmark. Denmark mm-hmm. still technically owns it. And you would think having come that far up, you wouldn't have anything like that, but you do. Mm-hmm. So that's why you really have to go more remote and go by dog sled to get to some of the other regions that aren't using power or water or things set up by Denmark, mm-hmm. because it's, it's interesting, you know, Denmark came in and uh, they, they built houses for everyone. So even though most of the people that you see, especially in the initial towns are living in a, a structure that looks like a house, they're still wearing fur, hunting for food and living a very indigenous life, but mm-hmm. they have this house that looks more modern. Mm-hmm. Right. And in the Northern parts where I was, they don't use the the snow plows like they do in the southern part so you can have a very different experience based on where you go Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of Greenland and I I think that's very actually uh, symbolic for Greenland because it's always been so separate it's not a place that could trade Uh, once the ice sets in which is 10 months of the year you can't really get from town to town unless you use a dog sled it's very difficult you can't go by boats you can't go by plane (laughs) you can't do these kinds of things so so they've always been quite isolated the little Mm -hmm. villages and yeah and so I think it's it's really quite fitting now I have a question I mean because of the, the the amount of daylight and stuff like that How do you feel that that works with their circadian rhythms and their overall health? I know so much emphasis is, is placed on sleep. And now we've got people that are in, you know, in, in our, in the U S and our culture, we, we have to try to get away from our screens so we can not mess up our circadian rhythm and get out in the morning and get sunlight. Like it's, but these people, they don't have those kind of things they have to work with. So how do, what is their sleeping, how do their sleeping patterns vary? Is that something that you learned while you were there? Oh, I I did learn quite a bit about it. I think there's probably so much more to learn. I think it's very seasonal and I think they likely need that light because they also have the opposite for a lot of the year where there's no light. Mm -hmm. And so they've really got to soak it up when they have it. And they don't, uh, they don't analyze so much. They just go out. So during the summer, they have more energy. So they're outside a lot of the day and they think it's warm. I mean, it's not warm. (laughs) The second you take off your seal fur, your skin hurts, your teeth hurt. It is not warm. It's warm when you're wearing the seal fur, but otherwise it's not. But to them, that's warm. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're used to having these seasons. I, I think it's very similar to a a seedling in the earth. You know, when you're planting a seed, you're a farmer, you know, so you plant the seed in the earth. Yeah. (laughs) And there's that season where it's just in darkness and rest. There's a lot of rest during the dark season. Mm -hmm. And then there's the spring where things start to come out. And I I think they live a bit more like a plant, to Mm -hmm. be honest, because from what I could gather, most people were sleeping about four hours a night, myself included, mm-hmm. but no one was wrecked. Mm-hmm. We weren't very smart. I will mm-hmm. say that. <laughs> I There was a marine biologist up there from Denmark who was studying the heavy metal levels in the seals because there's been dumping in the mm-hmm. waters and it's affected that. And uh, and he was saying that he, he couldn't find words that his Mm -hmm. IQ had gone down. And I I found the same. Oh, wow. I don't don't tend to be a loss for words. It's uh, very unique when I am. And I I was. So, but at the same time, it was kind of just that. Otherwise Mm -hmm. you felt really good. You felt like exercising in the morning. You felt good. So 
And you could be out and physically active all day and not really notice how much time had passed because mm-hmm. the sun is still in the same spot. So, <laughs> so it's really a bit of a time warp, but I, I don't think it's negatively affected their health to get such little sleep because it's for such a short season and then mm-hmm. they go into the long. And I would imagine, I mean, I saw so much of the organ meats being eaten. I can't mm-hmm. even tell you. I thought Peru was high on organ meats. The Arctic is very high on organ mm-hmm. meats. So they they're getting a lot of that uh that vitamin d and a and k but i think i think you you know they're really getting a lot through their skin in mm-hmm. the warm season so it balances out i don't think that would be healthy for us to mm-hmm. do year round or any humans to do year round but i mm-hmm. think that's why they've gotten away with it well and it is still cyclical if you think about it i mean mm-hmm. they're it's just like uh it's they're catching up like they they catch up and they recharge and then they go back to where they're, you know, to the dark times where it's more like hibernation and recharge your batteries. So I guess that would make total sense. Um, yes. Nutrition wise. Now they're eating a, like, are they eating a mostly carnivore diet or how does that look? Yes. So it depends on the generation. The older generation are still eating primarily the carnivore. I would mm-hmm. say it also depends their social status. So mm-hmm. there's technically a hotel in Kwanag. It's just a man who opens his house to researchers, basically. Mm-hmm. So he'll have access to some breads and things like that. And so there's some families in some regions where you can see the modern food has come in. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them still eat a primarily traditional diet. And the farther you go out, you certainly see that, mm-hmm. right? Um and I mean, far out from far out, you're, you're really going, you're really going out there. Mm -hmm. But so for instance, um, I went to a celebration and there was this, uh, this lovely, well, there was just this presentation of all the traditional foods. You know, we Mm -hmm. had the, the thing that killed Rasputin, the great, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the great adventure and explorer, the seal stuffed with 200 ox, the little birds Mm -hmm. that's fermented for a year. And they had the fermented narwhal and narwhal jerky and all the things, you know? So all of that is still eaten regularly. And, and of course it is the, the food is right there and it's their tradition and it's, uh, it's inexpensive, Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's free. It it takes work, but it's Mm -hmm. free. So that's still their staple. I mean, and it's still eaten the way that you would see from photographs back in the day. Like seals came out on my first day up there. There was a dog sled race, which was really fun to see. Mm-hmm. And and three seals were brought home. And people just dove in and started eating it raw, blood on the face, blood on the hands, and that kind of thing, as we would see from mm-hmm. the, the National Geographic photographs from the 40s and that kind of thing. So there's still a lot of that being done. And, and I would say the people that are still eating the traditional way seem very healthy. Mm-hmm. A hunter I met, I found a great translator up there who, mm-hmm. who was raised in Greenland. He's Greenlandic, and he happens to be a polyglot. So he spoke all four dialects, at least some. And so he was translating for this wonderful hunter uh, and I, and, and he had brought together all this amazing food from his hunts and, uh, and he was doing it for his, his daughter who he was celebrating. It was a party for her. And he was just so strong and healthy. You know, Mm -hmm. you just have to be so strong to be that kind of hunter, strong face, strong jaw. And you can see with the younger generations, especially in like the town, uh, the younger generations are really going towards the soda and the processed food. And you can see it in the jaw. They Mm -hmm. they get the narrow jaw. They're starting to get the acne. Mm -hmm. So the health issues are way behind what we're dealing with. And Mm -hmm. some of the generations and some of the families aren't having them. Mm -hmm. But those that have moved on into the modern are are certainly having Mm -hmm. them. And in fact, in southern Greenland, in some of the bigger towns and city, I mean, there's about 30,000 residents in Greenland. Mm-hmm. So, you know, take, take large into account, but or, or with a grain of salt, but they're having a very high suicide rate. I think there's a real lack of purpose that's going on, especially in the South with people as they, they kind of lose their traditional livelihoods and, and try to figure things out specifically in the late teen to early 20 generation. But mm-hmm. But yeah, so as long as they're eating the traditional foods, we don't see that, of course, which is always the pattern. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you traveled all over the place. Was there any commonalities you found amongst these places that are still off the grid and they're not partaking in more modern culture? 
Yes. Uh, respect and pride. So the regions or the cultures, the traditions that are really remaining true to themselves and where the people are very, very healthy and still living in the traditional way, there's an, uh, a reflection of respect from the outside world towards them. And the regions that are struggling more, like many parts of the Amazon, uh, parts of Greenland, parts of definitely the Canadian Arctic, uh, there's the opposite. There's a lack of respect and more of a like, well, get on with it. What you used to do is silly. Let's mm -hmm. let's get you very modernized kind of thing. And so, yeah, I think, I think that would be the biggest tie between mm -hmm. them all. Okay, so I have a looming question and you probably get mm -hmm. tired of asking, being asked this kind of stuff, yeah. but how about with COVID, like these places yeah. that are less modernized and eating more traditional diets, what did that look like for some of these places? Were you able to explore any, any of that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I went to, I think, 14 countries just this year alone, and I was traveling through the whole COVID <laughs> thing. So mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really, it wasn't a thing. It mm -hmm. honestly wasn't a thing. It just mm -hmm. didn't even hit these regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, I remember in the first year of COVID, I was hoping to go to Panama to see some of the more remote tribes, not the ones I, I just went to, some some different ones. Mm -hmm. And they were closed, as was the Samburu. They were closed because of historical issues with people mm -hmm. coming and bringing disease. But no, none of them were, were dealing with any of it. And in fact, it was almost a joke in some of the places we went to. I mean, when mm -hmm. we were in Uganda, there would be a thousand people gathered together and no one's wearing masks. And you mm -hmm. go into the hospitals and you ask the doctors if they're seeing anything and no one's seeing anything. Mm -hmm. um, so so no, COVID didn't hit these traditional cultures like it hit the, the more industrialized modern world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had curiosity about, about that because we know so much about how heavily impacted we are by our metabolic health and our lifestyles and our, I mean, a lot of us are sedentary now and you don't see that as much in the remote cultures. And so I was curious if you saw that firsthand, how, how different it had affected things. Yeah, I think, I think it comes down to a couple of things. Uh, it's the metabolic health, right? Mm -hmm. Which really gets at your immune system. But they also typically have very high nitric oxide, which mm -hmm. is really important for mm -hmm. preventing infection. And they typically have a high a diet high in thiamine. Thiamine mm -hmm. is something we're really lacking in our modern diets. And historically, when we would see post-viral syndrome and also epidemics, especially with an infection where cytokines are involved, like this one, mm -hmm. it was due to the lack of B1 mm -hmm. uh, and, and the bioavailable form of B1. So things like post-viral used to be very rare. I mean, it happened to the people who survived Ebola, you mm -hmm. know, and there are cases of it as far back as 2000 years ago, mostly in rice eating cultures. And that's, that's mainly because rice is, has thiamine binding protein. So although white rice is a traditional food, it was always eaten with pork or fish. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you take it out of that context, say you're just one of those people that doesn't like pork or fish. Uh, so you're just eating the white rice, then you deplete yourself of thiamine. And when that happens, you can't control your cytokines. Mm -hmm. And so your cytokines can go very high with an infection. And then you can either die with these infections or get post-viral syndrome. Mm -hmm. So I think those things have a large play in it. But also what I've seen over and over again is that when you're eating and living in a traditional way, infections are just a non-issue. It's mm -hmm. not something that they deal with, uh, even in elderly years, until they start to bring in our, our even, honestly, even a small percentage of mm -hmm. what we do. Mm -hmm. Do you think a lot of that also has to do with our, our general GI health? Because I feel like the more remote you get, the more things you're being exposed to that your body has to process, like even on our, the foods you eat, the bacteria that you consume and stuff like that. Whereas we live in a culture here where everybody's wanting to put on antibacterial things and keep everything as clean as possible. And I feel like that also affects our ability to process germs. Completely, completely, because you don't have all the good ones, right? You're wiped out. It's a clean slate. And, and <laughs> really serious infections, what they love more than anything else is a clean slate, right? Mm -hmm. There's no one to compete. I often, when I'm talking to clients and I talk to them about raw meats and things like this, they get very scared. And so I tell them about how, well, when you have a raw meat, like a tartar, 
let's say, or a sashimi if you want to go more culturally acceptable, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you take the raw protein, it has probiotics on it. So all of those probiotics prevent any kind of pathogenic bacteria or virus from overgrowing and taking over. The second it's cooked, that's a very different story. And that's why in restaurants, the meats have to be very separated, the cooked versus the raw. Uh, it's not so much, raw meat is not problematic. In fact, if you if you look at the CDC with food poisoning, it's it, the percentages are usually from cooked food where people mm -hmm. are getting sick. It's about 97%, it changes each year. So the raw isn't so problematic and what you see a lot of in these traditional cultures is just that they're just a full petri dish like mm -hmm. when you're when you're with the messiah and you go to drink the milk the women are standing in just mud and poo and they're milking and their hands have bacteria and the milk has bacteria and the udder has bacteria and it's all going into a little gourd and then you all share it amongst all 30 of you you all pass it around and share it and then the blood goes in that I mean you could not get more bacteria if you wanted to and that's just a normal <laughs> daily activity so so I think you know we were we're meant to be all these different things. And, and we are these things. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in our last one, we talked a lot about the microbiome, right? Cause mm -hmm. we went into the gaps diet. Well, I have been giving talks this year on the virome, which is 37,000 times larger than mm -hmm. the microbiome, right? Mm -hmm. Our viruses, we don't even know what they do for us. We know that certain viruses protect us from others. Like there's a, a strain of the herpes virus that prevents mm -hmm. you from getting AIDS. So, so we can't just go in and say that viruses are bad and we need to be an, in an antiviral situation and, and wipe all this out. So I think to your point, uh, I really think, uh, well, again, I always, I always love Dr. Natasha McBride, but I, mm -hmm. I love her latest work. She's been talking a lot about, um, the need for more viruses, more bacteria, not less. Mm -hmm. And the the way the quorum sensing uh, mm -hmm. of the bacteria and how L form bacteria can be turned back to the healthy form. And I think that's more of the future of health, which really is just us getting mm -hmm. in our heads, trying to make something very complicated when traditional cultures have been doing it simply for thousands of years, mm -hmm. <laughs> really, if we mm -hmm. break it down. Well, mm -hmm. that's definitely one thing I've noticed across the board with my clients as well. I mean, I have a pretty substantial client base at this point and all of the people that work in like the medical field and yeah. in fields where things are very, very sterile, they seem to yeah. be the ones that get the, get sick the most. They have the most digestive, uh, issues. And I'm just like, there's got to be a correlation between all this. I mean, I, I know there is, but uh, it's always yes. interesting to hear from somebody else, especially somebody that's traveled abroad and gone different places, the things that you've observed yeah. that go along with that. Hospitals just feel very, very unnatural. I think in the 1800s, there was this movement to have open air hospitals and for the, the ill to have an open air room. And there's a lot to that. I think as we're starting to get into these devices that are measuring our HRV and our sleep patterns. We're starting to notice the things that help us the most. And I, it's really difficult to heal outside of nature and nature mm -hmm. is not sterile. Mm -hmm. And an ocean, just a drop of ocean water has so many viruses. I forget the number, but it is mind blowing mm -hmm. how many viruses are in there. Mm -hmm. So we're not meant to be in a sterile environment. And I know my friends who work in hospitals, they hose themselves down before going in the house. There's mm -hmm. super bugs. It's just not a natural mm -hmm. or a lovely place to be in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. So out of all of the places you went and the things that you uh, consumed, what were some of the most interesting things? I know I saw some pretty interesting <laughs> Instagram stories where I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I could quite go there, but you are so good. <laughs> You're so good at trying everything. I commend you. Uh, but what was some of the most interesting things that you saw culturally as far as Thank food you. goes? Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, no, I really love it. When I'm in the moment, I I love it because I feel so honored that they're letting me try these things. So so it's it's a rush. It's a rush, which helps honestly. But I think I think uh, eating the the birds that had been fermented in the seal belly for a year 
the raw birds. I mean, they were liquefying. And the the old, the old Green Manic women picking off the feathers and, and stripping off the meats for me to eat. And it was, it was actually delectable. I expected to use all of my upbringing. My mother raised me well. So I'm really good at not making a stink face if I don't like something. But I expected to use all of that when I when I ate a lot of these foods. And I didn't have to, it was actually really good, but it, it was also exciting to eat that because I'm not always sure if I'm going to do all the foods. Like, mm. uh, I, I always know that I'll go for most of it, but there's some dangerous ones. Like the, mm -hmm. those ox are, are dangerous. They can have botulism in them. So mm -hmm. if you don't have the constant, uh, the probiotic influx that a traditional culture would have, you're at more risk, yes. right? They're not at risk, but we could be at risk. Mm -hmm. So so I didn't know if I would, but I, I didn't even think about it when she handed it to me. I was like, yes, mm -hmm. yes, I will eat that. And I was so glad. And she loved that. I loved it. It was really fun. Um, I also, and, and I know I'm sure I'll get judgment for this, but I guess I should preface it or buffer speech it by, I, I researched traditional foods and I really do need to know what it's like. So so and and these things aren't sold outside of the cultures and they're not over hunted it was very exciting to eat narwhal and also polar bear two animals i love i have a, a dog that looks like a polar bear it's not <laughs> that i'm like out there trying to eat these foods i'm not trying to eat narwhal in the future but it was really lovely to eat uh with them in their traditional way and see what it's actually like which was so different than I expected to be mm -hmm. perfectly honest. It was prepared in, in about seven different ways. Mm -hmm. And, and that was really interesting. And then, uh, well, also eating piranha this year in the Amazon, surprisingly delectable. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Uh, they don't, they don't do the skin anymore. I ate some of the skin, I, fish skin and chicken skin are some of my favorite foods, mm -hmm. but the, they've had some illegal mining there. So there's, there can be some heavy metals there. And so not amongst the indigenous big corporations have come in and yeah. done some illegal mining. So there's some heavy metals there. So they don't do that fatty tissue, the brain or the skin anymore. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. They, they noticed people were getting sick when they did it. I don't think they know specifically what it's from, but, uh, but I think those, those would probably be the most, I did eat a big rodent with the Hudson this year. Mm -hmm. That was kind of just seared. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting. Oh, and Guinea pig with the Peruvians. Oh, how was the Again, Guinea pig? Surprisingly good. Okay. Surprisingly I good. Yeah. Okay. I was curious because, uh, well, we used to have pet guinea pigs. And so we used to yeah. always joke, like, you know, if the zombie apocalypse is coming, we have some big gu guinea pigs, we can eat them. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, one we, so I'll tell a fun little story here, but we, uh, I might get judgment as well, but, uh, <laughs> we used to actually butcher llamas and eat them. Oh, wow. Um, and not a lot of people eat llama, but it's actually quite delicious. Uh, Ooh. and so I was curious if you had discovered that any, in any yeah. of your travel travels eating llama, cause in the U S most people don't, but, uh, yes. it's actually consumed I, frequently in other places. Good. Yeah. It tastes like beef filet. Mm -hmm. I eat llama and alpaca. I ate mm -hmm. more alpaca than I did llama, but mm -hmm. yes, I ate both this year when I was in Peru mm -hmm. and, uh, and all throughout North, actually, it was quite good. It was really mm -hmm. good. It, um, yeah, I had filet. I had tartar. I had, I had it a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. I would say the Guinea pig. Wow. I, you know, I grew up with rodents as pet. I grew up with chinchillas, oh, not chinchillas. I did have chinchillas. I also had gerbils mm -hmm. and I've always really loved animals. And so I didn't think I would eat the guinea pig, but I, I finally broke and was like, my duty, I got to try it. Yeah. And then all I could think was, okay, no wonder this is a staple. This is delicious. Like, how could it mm -hmm. not be? <laughs> no wonder. Everyone I was asking what their favorite food was, they kept saying the guinea pig in their the native language, guinea pig. Mm -hmm. But oh my goodness, so you're onto something. Make sure you've got plenty in case there's an apocalypse. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm sure my kids will love that. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's funny. Um, so <laughs> circling, <laughs> circling back to some of that stuff though. Um, I feel like, yeah. There, oh, so do you know, do, do you know, Bill Schindler? I think you do. Of course. Yeah. 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 I, I'm pretty sure you guys are a connection, but I, he yeah. talks about Mongolia. I think it was where he, he was at and he was in the city and he orders like a, 
organ platter and he orders like a, a muscle tissue platter and the muscle tissue is just looks awful. And then the organ platter, they, they, it's like, it's like they're the best thing that you can buy. Right. And he said, when he yeah. gets up into the tribes, he sees that the, all the regular meat, they just kind of throw in a pile and they don't care about, but the organs, they treat them like they are the gold standard of everything. Yes. And so it's really cool to listen to his stuff when he talks about traditional eating as well. Yes, completely. I'm actually hoping to go to Mongolia with him later this year. Uh, we're really trying to get this trip going. I'm trying to go in October. I have the whole trip planned. We're just waiting on the flights to open. Mongolian flights haven't opened, at least not to the, the further regions where they have the eagle hunting. So, so hopefully I'll get to go do that with him, but that's definitely the pattern for sure. The only exception there would be in uh, one region of Panama, one of the groups I went to see, but it, it could have been a language barrier as well, because mm -hmm. when I asked the question differently, they, they were like, oh, well, we eat deer liver when we were pregnant. And I, mm -hmm. I had asked if they were eating liver and they were like, no, 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 no. But when you put it with deer, then it's a yes. So, so yes, yeah, sometimes it's one of those things, but by and far and large, the whole animal is eaten, skin, hooves, literally everything. Mm -hmm. And any product that isn't used is, is in food, in cuisine is used elsewhere. So for instance, with the Greenlandic, they take the intestines and stretch them out to make windows, which were surprisingly effective. You can't see what's going on outside, but the light comes in mm -hmm. very, very well. Mm -hmm. The tendons can be used for fishing. So, so yeah, really everything is used in the prized items are not what we prize. It's all the parts we discard. Mm -hmm. The organ meats I think are, are really the key. So I, I'm glad to see that there's been this big movement towards them and, and hopefully towards some of the more obscure ones, to be honest. I think, mm -hmm. I think some of the most powerful ones are things like the thymus and the, um, uh, hypothalamus and the thyroid and the adrenals and the smaller ones mm -hmm. kidney for histamine folks mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so if there was one thing that you learned from this last stint of trip of trips was there anything that you learned that you hadn't known before that was kind of universal oh. amongst all these I know that's a hard question uh gosh this was such a different year since January um I would say, okay, okay, I think I got it. Um, I would say that the environmentalists have no place telling them what to do. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say, that they know so much more about stabilizing the environment mm -hmm. than anyone sitting in a chair mm -hmm. could ever pretend to. And when we go and try to meddle with them, we cause a lot of problems. And mm -hmm. so even our very well-intentioned efforts to bring schools, to bring churches, to uh, get them to eat different foods than their traditional foods because maybe a population is dwindling, something mm -hmm. like that, it has long lasting massive consequences. And mm -hmm. so really the best thing that we can offer is our respect and to learn from them instead of trying to change them. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's the biggest one. Um, the second one, if I had to give a secondary one, would be the impact of heavy metals on the environment. Mm -hmm. I, I've i always been, and I might have said this in the last one, I've always been someone who's like, you know what, just focus on what you can control. And I, I think that's really important. Otherwise, you can go crazy, you know, yeah. so just focus on what you can control. You can control what you put in your mouth, what you think, and how you live your life. Those are the three things you can control. The environment, what's in the air radio waves, whatnot. You can't always control that kind of stuff. So why stress? Mm -hmm. But I did see many cultures this year, which I hadn't seen before impacted by heavy metals. And they're not impacted in the way that we are. Uh, it's not that, but you can see that even in a traditional standpoint, if the toxins are so high, that can be an issue mm -hmm. uh, that can maybe bring you down from a level 10 out of 10 health to a nine out of 10, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Something like that. So that would be my second one. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I really appreciate you taking the time out to chat about all of this stuff. Yes. I was super excited to get caught up to speed on everything, especially after following all of your awesome travels. And so you guys go follow her. What's your Instagram handle? Oh, um, Mary queen of hearts. Okay. That's what that's it was. What it yeah. <laughs> um, go follow her. I can even put it in the show notes, follow her adventures, check out her stuff. How can everybody find you? 
other than oh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram is great. Also enableyourhealing.com is my general website. Yes. Yeah. I I, honestly, it was so lovely to hang out. I've wanted to hang out with you since our last one. I so enjoy our time. I'm dying one of these days when my schedule clears, we've got to get together. Exactly. Cause you're really not that far away in all actuality. Exactly. So come visit and we'll go do all the fun things. It's not like your normal adventures, okay. but I can give you a whole new one. <laughs> I'm for all of them. All of them. It sounds really good. Thank you so, so much, much, Mary. Fun. 